And with that statement, the penitentiary guard brings him up to the front porch. The wind starts to pick up a little. The sky is darkening. And Detective Felicia Jenner remarks, Look, let's just get him inside and at least get out of the bloody rain. And she begins to lead you in to the house. Inside, it's crude and cold. There is a persistent scent of mildew. Furniture, photos, wall tapestries, all these still remain. There is no electricity currently in the house. The only light coming from outside, which there's little of, and Detective Felicia Jenner's flashlight. She has actually bought some spares. She actually gives cats one. He takes it. Just cats. Indeed, just cats. She seems to sort of look at you, Caitlin, and assume you're going to follow her. Caitlin turns on the torch on her iPad. Because screw you. Indeed. (laughs) And it illuminates the area quite well. You are led into the main part of the house, which leads into a living room. There is a large burn spot on the wall-to-wall carpet, and the roof is black from soot. There are remains of burnt clothes and toys, which you know belonged to William Bedford. The wallpaper is torn down in places and peeling from the walls in large sheets, exposing the yellow medallion print wallpaper behind them. What remains of the furniture stands against the wall, but there's a vacant place where the TV set once stood. Obviously, looters have been in. Caitlin, you of course are watching Mr. Mills. It's been very interesting. He already has opened up with a diatribe the second you've entered this room. <clears throat> so, uh, what the fuck do you fuckers want, eh? Is this where you fucking execute me? Uh, is that how it is in America these days? You gotta fucking execute me? Fucking gunpoint to the back of the head? Is that how it works, eh? Fucking, Mr. Fucking Mills? People. Yeah, what? What do you remember of this room? Fuck you. You don't remember, for example, the wallpaper? Golden medallions? Fuck do I remember any- I never fucking been in this stupid house. Shitty house. Why the fuck have you people brought me here? Fuck, is this part of your stupid murder do you know fucking un- charge? Do, Mr. Mills, do you understand it? In places that the wallpaper has been torn down, but you can still see that this room was decorated once before. Is it to your liking? Something you could see yourself living in. <laughs> he snorts and spits on the floor, kind of scratching at his arm. Place is a shithole. Everywhere around here is a shithole. So I don't live around here anymore. <laughs> anymore. But I noticed that they are, they are missing a TV. Uh, quite an old-fashioned sort of place. Franklin's sort of looking around the room, looking a little distressed suddenly. You notice... Joshua, he came in very sure of himself, as Miss Caitlin said, very calm. Doesn't seem so calm anymore now he's in the house. Two things. Joshua, one thing he wants to watch is as Krostoff passes through past the front of the stairwell where he was beaten. What any reaction that... Krostoff might have passing by the place where he once was holding William rescuing him but then was beaten by this man now standing in front of him taken away. How is he behaving as he passes over through that narrow hallway at the bottom of the stairs possibly with his blood still staining the floor and the walls what's his attitude? From what you get just on your base intuition He doesn't seem very happy. He's trying to seem very official, very sombre. An awful lot like the penitentiary guard, who, you both have noticed, is paying no attention to anything. He's literally just watching Mills, making sure he doesn't do anything. Otherwise, he's listening to some music on his iPod. He couldn't care less about what's going on. Aiden is trying to seem like that, but you do notice him sort of glance about a bit, and he kind of reaches for his uh, belt... And you notice there's a holster there, but it's currently empty. He kind of looks, and you would obviously know at this point, Mr. Katz, that he has not been reissued a firearm. He did, after all, lose his previous one. And yeah, he's kind of looking around, looking a bit distressed, but 
trying to look official and in a way kind of letting you two take the floor. He feels like he's there just to watch Mills. I just specifically was interested as he was almost the hero of this story, how he was taking it that he is not. And Joshua just, again, notes in his mind, should have had a vest for for Franklin, seeing his hand just almost subconsciously drift towards his gun belt. Jenna is sort of eyeing the burn marks. She sort of snoops around it for a bit and just sort of shakes her head. She then says, Come on, shrink. Enough with the fucking wallpaper. Why don't you tell him why he burned the kid's fucking toys? It's fucking sick. That's what that is. Fucking sick. Felicia, might I suggest you take a moment to have a look around the perimeter or something that detracts you from this situation as clearly you are feeling agitated. Felicia huffs, reaches into her pocket, takes out a small silver flask and sort of has a very quick sip of it as she nods and seems to obey your command. She seems quite happy to get out of the room. You notice her fiddle with her revolver. She is still fully armed, of course. I look to Joshua for a moment and give him a very disapproving look. It's clearly not directed at him, but she looks agitated that someone has jumped two-footed into her room, uh, into her world, and sort of stomped around, upsetting the the core, as it were. Joshua notes this, looks back to her to see what her next move is, but begins to drift towards the kitchen and the sink himself, sort of leaning against the bar almost casually to uh, look and watch how Caitlin handles herself. Caitlin just adjusts her glasses slightly and looks around the room. Franklin, this is a family home and as our colleagues so pointedly mentioned a childhood was destroyed in this home do you remember anything about why it was that it was necessary to take apart so much to try and restore it to how it was. Franklin gives you a look for a moment. I keep telling you. Why would I know anything? I've never even... And he kind of closes his eyes for a moment. And then you're pretty sure. He murmurs something. It's a bit hard to hear, but you're quite close. And you're, pretty, you're sure you catch most of it. He seems to murmur suddenly. I mean, he'll, he'll have nothing left. Nothing at all. No friends, no toys. If you have nothing, you... You are empty. There's nothing holding you. Mm. Mm. What do you do? She takes a step closer, only a step, still holding herself back, but opening herself up to him a little more. And uh, she slips uh, her iPad away into her bag, making herself seem more more casual. She's going to check the kitchen counter over, make sure that there's nothing sort of, no dust, nothing sort of, no spillages, nothing at all that could be disturbed there. And she will place her handbag on the kitchen counter. As you look into the kitchen while doing that, as you can see it's an open plan type kitchen affair, you do quickly notice some chairs, a table standing against one of the walls. And your eyes just sort of linger for a moment on a dark spot on the water wall carpet, which you know, of course, comes from Ryan Bedford's blood. You know this is where he was nailed to the floor. You can just about see as you squint at the two holes in the floor where that happened. A musty stench emanates from the sink, and there's a can of spray paint left lying around as well on the table that you... Oh, just that. Mm. With that, she turns politely and uh, folds her hands 
It's easier when you feel empty, isn't it, Franklin? If you're empty, there's nothing turbulent inside you. Makes you stronger. Yes? Look, lady, he says, sort of standing up a bit and again, suddenly seeming more here, more alert. That murmuring was quite quiet, but again, he suddenly is very assertive. Look, lady, I took a polygraph test, right? I ain't lying. I don't know you. I don't know what the fuck is going on here. This is all some fucking frame off. That cop, these cops, what a fucking frame me. They probably killed these people, killed this family. I don't know, cop conspiracy. And now they're fucking after me. Hard work in American Joe me. Josh catches his eye during this rant and very almost like a, a little bit of a snap to his voice, sort of almost dad voice. Why'd you wash the knife? What? What fucking knife, suit? The knife. He motions his head towards the spot of blood. You washed the knife. I don't know why you, why, why does anyone wash a knife? Why, why? And he sort of then looks down again. And again, he sort of murmurs, you, you need to be clean. Mum hates a mess. She hates a mess. Mm. Yeah, you fucking clean the knife. What? Again, he just looks really confused all of a sudden at you. Franklin, I noticed that whoever was last in this room has made quite a mess of the wallpaper. What do you think of the new wallpaper? The one that's torn, tattered? Shit. Fucking... Shit. You'd need to tear it down as well, I understand. Need to make it look better as it was. Bring the room back. Mum wouldn't like it. Caitlin smiles to him and she waits for him to finish and then turns to Joshua. I walk over to the wallpaper and I kind of would like to investigate it as often is in certainly old houses in cheaper parts of town, how many layers of wallpaper are there? And is it is there an older wallpaper underneath or a painted surface beneath that, sort of catching what Caitlin is talking about? Is this removing perhaps the new occupants redecorating? I think you're going to need to roll and investigate for that. So please, make an investigate move. Roll plus reason. Twelve. You're pretty sure, yeah, there's a whole other layer under there. But maybe not much more than that. Like, the one underneath actually looks pretty old compared to the newer stuff on it. Felicia's gone. Krostoff is still here in the room? Yes, but again, he's standing very on guard. He's not really observing what you're doing. He's almost sort of standing sentry, if you will. I will go over and try to separate out sort of levels, layers of paper. Actually, I take a very nice silver cross pen out of my jacket pocket and wary of fingerprints, so trying to take a little bit of care with it, use it instead of using my hands to pry it back. But I do make sure I get it done, so it, I am absolutely tearing through it, but taking a little bit of care with it as I use what is a very expensive pen to do a very menial task. And you start to peel away a bit at the wallpaper, and you get a little bit more of a feeling for what the older wallpaper looked like. You're pretty sure it's got a weird sort of cross design to it, I mean, it's a bit hard to tell, but it looks very religious, actually. You know, it looks as if that's the sort of wallpaper. Not in a weird way, but in a very sort of like, you know, some houses back in the day would have had very nice sort of Christian-looking wallpaper with a nice picture of the cross on it in a nice, neat fashion. That seems to be the main wallpaper underneath, actually. Going further than that, you seem to hit wall and notice some old paint. But it does actually look as if the wallpapering for a very long time was this old wallpaper and it's only been very recent that new wallpaper's been put up I will take a step over to Joshua whilst Franklin is sort of maybe glancing around the room or 
staring at his uh, guard who is keeping an eye on him or Aiden or is in any way distracted, I will turn to Joshua and feign intense interest in what he's doing and say, Do you notice how he was tearing the wallpaper? How he was trying to restore the room, even went as far as removing the television. There wouldn't have been a TV here in a God-fearing family back in those days. It is a little jump, but it is not a massive leap to assume that he was bringing it back and nailing somebody to the floor. Through his feet, with large nails. It's not lost on me. I have a... He stops himself for a moment. Because he's sensible. This is not the way he wants this to go. These are not the facts that he do, that he is wanting to find. You are hesitant about this. I look over. You can't. I can't help but look over to where the blood stain is centered in the middle of the dining room, and the wall-to-wall carpet there. What do you think? Do you think that carpet was here? It's also at this point as you're sort of looking around the room again, Mr. Katz, and almost now focusing on the wallpaper that you almost didn't realise when you passed it earlier, but you just looked down the hall because, you know, you're in a position where if you turn your head to the left or so, you can see the hall and you shine your flashlight in curiosity. You noticed a lot of graffiti when you came in. Perhaps you initially thought it was just part of vandalism, but... You notice, and Caitlin, you turn your attention as well. After all, you're now looking at the walls. A lot of the graffiti is over family photos and framed drawings. Some of them done by a child that were hanging on the wall. They've all been spray-painted out. Possibly with that spray can on the table, in fact. Is this just like straight lines, or is it like intentional coverage, or is it words? It's intentional coverage, but in a haphazard manner. So it's not like it was done neatly, it was more... Scribbles. Yes. What was it he said about being empty inside? Black is the color of absence. Void. He is trying to take away this family, because this family is in the place where his family was taken from him. Joshua, I understand that this is difficult. But you need to understand that I have devoted my life to understanding these people. At the end of the day, I still am trying to get this boy back. If uncovering the secrets here, to open his mind, to find that boy, then whatever path you need to lead us down, All I ask is you guide us back. I'm going to uh, sort of very, very gently put a hand on Joshua's uh, arm uh, and nodding to uh, the guard um, as if to sort of motion for him that we uh, we're just taking a moment. I'm going to say, would you walk with me, Mr. Katz? And I'll take a step uh, into the corridor sort of slightly away uh, from where Franklin is standing. Just as you're about to go and lead Mr. Katz off, your phone dings. You've got a text message, Caitlin. She pauses for a moment, gives a very apologetic smile to uh, Joshua, uh, and says, um, don't vanish on me. She says, sort of, trying to almost lighten the situation ever so slightly. Uh, Probably just a client. And she will step into the kitchen and pull out her phone. She doesn't sort of leave the room. She doesn't sort of, uh, it's all open plan. But she steps uh, just out of reach of prying eyes for she is a psychiatrist. And confidentiality is very important to clients. And I will check my text message. The message reads... I am feeling terrible. I've cut myself again. When do you have time to talk? We need to talk. 
I know you said what I need to do. I'm afraid. Josie, you know this number. You know the person, Caitlin. Or rather, you did know them. Okay. What do you do? Caitlin pauses and studies this and there's... The only expression that really shows on her face is deep concentration as she ponders it. And you notice, like, Joshua will notice that she almost... She holds the phone in front of her and then she pulls the phone screen away from her just a few inches and then closer again as if she can't quite as if she's trying to see you know how you have optical illusions those images that you, only from the right angle only from the right perspective or the right distance you can make out the hidden image within that's probably what it looks like it's that kind of trying to study something as if willing uh, the screen to reveal more to her uh, which, uh, having been uh, called off guard by this text, there's not a lot she can do to hide. But it's she still seems composed, and she will send a message back saying, When would be convenient to meet? Josie. You send the message, and it says, Message failure. Number disconnected. She shrugs and uh, locks her phone. Um, and slips her phone uh, it back into her, her cardigan pocket and um, she notices that uh, her handbag is still on the kitchen counter and she will take a step over to um, pick up her, her handbag and swing it back over her shoulder and she will rejoin Joshua and with one sweeping gesture, point to the corridor uh, to resume their conversation. Of course. Please continue your conversation. She says, Mr. Katz, I have studied many a case of killers, serial killers, who have been incarcerated for long periods of time. Especially those whose victims were not always located. Do you know how many instances there are where a killer, after years of silence, will offer up some hope of finding the body? Some fleeting glimpse of what happened simply to get a day out in the sun even under security protections they do this often for one very simple reason it is their way of holding on to power of what they have done and I've seen it time and time again families against the advice of the police, of counsellors, of experts, they get sucked straight back in, because who wouldn't do everything they could to protect their child, to find that closure? If you want to unwrap this, he will need help remembering this isn't going to be resolved in an afternoon you know this I know this you can read it all over his face we don't have the luxury of time once you uh, you're not going to have the luxury of years either once he's incarcerated he's going to go on trial he's going to get the death penalty and he's going to be killed at this point, you just hear Jenna sort of very loudly come back in. She hasn't been listening to your conversation, but she seems to have just caught the end of it. And she snorts. God damn right, I wish she was getting the death penalty. If only they had it here in Michigan, eh? Fucking liberals. Caitlin turns and gives a sad smile to Joshua. 
You think more death will bring closure to the family? I think it will bring closure to this city. Then I turn a withering glare at Felicia. So, care to, uh, to show us more what you know in all this? She sort of sighs a bit, scratches her chin. Yeah, sure. I mean, didn't get much time to look around. Obviously, he came in from the back. Not much there. Guess we should go upstairs. Maybe put him in the closet, eh? Hey, Frankie? You want to go in the closet? I turn to her and all but put a hand on her shoulder to stop her. But I'm going to do this and make sure that I look back because I need to know how he reacts to hearing that. He reacts with a sudden wince. He kind of goes, Fuck you, lady. Closet. Put you in a fucking closet. But he, again, looking upstairs. Looking upstairs. Back at you. Upstairs. Mr. Katz, you've noticed something for a while now. You kind of noticed it as soon as you were sort of tapping at that wallpaper. As soon as your hand kind of brushed against the boards of this building. You thought you heard a dripping sound. It kind of went away and you've been preoccupied, but suddenly again now, much louder, there's a dripping sound coming from upstairs. Quite loud. Drip. 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 Yes, upstairs should be our next spot. Officer, if you can bring Franklin up with us. The officer begins to do so with Aiden assisting, although Aiden looks a bit uncomfortable. He looks upstairs himself. He seems to sort of be sort of clearing his throat a little. Mills resists for a moment, going, the fuck, you're going to take me fucking upstairs? Is that way you fucking kill me, you fucking wackos with your suit? Ugh. But he kind of gives in because he is handcuffed and cannot resist two big men. And he is taken upstairs. Jenna waits for you to go upstairs. I'll cover you from behind, suit. Katz is fine with that because he wants to make sure he's between Franklin and her gun. And he's a pretty big guy, especially up a narrow staircase. Caitlin, just before Joshua walks upstairs, says, May I go first? Just a step or two in front of you. Seeing it unoccupied with my own eyes. Miss Caitlin, you go up, and shortly after, Mr. Katz does, and after him, Miss Jenna. As you go upstairs, Caitlin, you notice it first. The upper floor is not as in bad shape as the bottom floor. The light trickling in from outside, minimal at this point. Day is slowly ending and the storm outside is... You know, just starting to intensify quite a bit. You can now actually hear the rain pattering against the house. Odd, the weather didn't suggest that sort of bad rain today. Never mind. Um, you look around. As you come up the stairs, you immediately will find yourself facing a very small hallway. There's a little sitting room up here. Bathroom seems to be down the right. And the main bedroom of the area is on the left. Is the door open to the bedroom? Yes. Is the door open to the bathroom? Yes, both doors are wide open. And the dripping is quite clearly coming from... Actually, you assume the bathroom. But you could also hear a bit of a drip coming from the bedroom as well. It definitely sounds stronger coming from the bathroom, though. Yes, you're sure of that. You're actually, for a moment, both of you quite unsure why suddenly it's so hard to detect the sound of dripping. Not sure what's going on there. Uh, In which case, she'll um, take a step to the right towards the open door of the bathroom. And uh, I know it was dark in here and uh, sort of we're using flashlights, uh, but there are windows. Are the curtains drawn in here? You notice it's a bathroom with no windows. I will use the light from my iPad to uh, I'll pull it out again and light up the room. And steal a glance before anyone joins me. 
Some of the tiles have fallen from the wall, leaving black patches. The smell of mould and waste oil is heavy in the air. Behind a dirty and discoloured shower curtain, the bathtub is almost brimming over with oily, filthy water. Almost black. How full is it? Completely full. In fact, the drip sound seems to just be coming from the main faucet. It's almost soon will be overflowing, but right now, it's just at that level where you can still hear that drip. Although now you're in the room, the drip suddenly sounds very quiet, almost unnoticeable. I'm going to scan the wall that would adjoin to the what I would assume would be the master bedroom. Can I see any damage to the wall, uh, other than sort of maybe some tiles? Any holes? Any? Nothing that major. This looks more just like neglect. To be honest, you're pretty sure that this wasn't mentioned in the crime report. Nothing happened in the bathroom, except... Wait, no. Wasn't the, one of the bodies found in the bathroom? You, you, you're trying to remember this. You'd have to look at your notes quickly to re-verify that. But you're pretty sure, apart from maybe... Maybe the body of the babysitter, you think? Was she... F- hmm. She will check her notes and remember that uh, Lynn just... Kloski? William's babysitter was found brutally assaulted with a crowbar. So uh, Joshua will probably, you know, again, being curious about the dripping and seeing Caitlin go that way, will sort of step up sort of like all but behind her right there in the threshold and seeing her check her notes go, the babysitter, yeah. The interesting part is he killed her downstairs then drug her up here and he looks at the bathtub threw her in there, but... That's waste oil. The kind of waste oil that you'd find, perhaps, in the engine room of a derelict ship. Mr. Katz, you immediately notice, at this point, him saying that. The CSI report said nothing about this at all. I need you to be scientific. I brought you here, Caitlin, to be the science of memory not to be saying that somehow water from an old ship, just because this smells oily, is the same water of the other crime scene. I'm saying that there is a link between the two, and I'm saying that we are still missing a body. Cats in a very pragmatic and scientific way just basically walks right over. He does roll up his sleeve uh, to make sure it doesn't get wet and reaches in to drain the tub. You reach your hand into the black, oily water. You are surprised, Mr. Katz. You've just said how it can't be what it is. It certainly feels oily. You feel for the chain... And your hand comes up very quickly. It's broken. In order to empty the tub, you're going to have to really get your hand in there and try and find the actual plug itself. So the chain's broken off the plug, it seems. So you really are going to have to deep down. Yeah, no, Katz now takes off his nice wool overcoat that he's been wearing, sort of folds it over his arm and hands it to Caitlin, unbuttons his shirt sleeve, rolls it up, and still... With the, this is just something weird with the pipes, with the water. When the water gets turned off, black water comes out. He's very much in denial about this, but he's going to drain this tub and reaches deep into the tub to pull the plug. Specifically, I would like to step over before he does this. This is going to be a really specific question. Is it two taps or one? One. Caitlin will come over and join him and she will uh, pull her cardigan up against sort of the the overpowering caustic kind of smell of this uh, waste oil she will just gently hold her hand under the tap very carefully and wait for a drip and see if it's hot or cold. Meanwhile I'm pulling the plug. First of all Caitlin you feel a nice oily black sludgy cold 
Meanwhile, cats, you think you find the plug, and you're just about to give it a good pull when you just feel something sharp. Just sort of, like, you can tell it, you know, it's that feeling you feel when you just put your hand to a knife. You just sort of feel something by your hand. What do you do? I, I try not to cut myself, but I also want to try to pick up whatever it is with some care. You reach for it, and yet you find nothing. It's almost like it floats away instantly the second you try and reach for it. Then I go back for the plug again, and I sort of look at Caitlin questioningly as she's testing the temperature, not quite understanding what she's trying to do. Caitlin pulls out a tissue, just a white tissue, and wipes her finger on it, leaving behind an oily smudge, and takes a step back to let him do to tamper with. I'm going to let you do all the tampering with the crime scene. You're a prosecutor. You pull the plug. You hear a bit of a slurping noise and a bit of a glunk gunk and the water goes down maybe a millimetre and stops. It would appear you will need a plunger to drain the tub. Unless there is something now that is floated to obstruct. Yeah, I assume I don't. I just feel that there's no suction from the... Um... No suction from the pipe anymore? Nope, none. Joshua just sort of looks at her with a incredulous look and does that sort of sweep around the inside of the tub to see if he can find whatever object it was that he felt when he first put his hand in. Nothing. You literally move your hand back and forth. You're getting very messy now, Mr. Katz, and you're finding nothing in this tub. But I suppose you definitely now know that there's definitely nothing large in the tub because your hand is moving through the sludge unblocked. He uh, pulls his hand out. I assume it's covered in this sludge. He probably has not done a wonderful job of keeping his shirt cuff clean, which he looks at with disdain. Um, are there any towels in the in this uh, bathroom left? Yes, there are. Not very clean. But. Yeah, better than using my shirt or something else. And so he is going to, as you often have to do with oil, water doesn't help you at all. Sort of have to do that sort of deep, you know, sort of scrape to get the stuff off of him. Seems a bit upset about this whole situation. At this point, you do hear outside a little bit of commotion. Uh, Mr. Mills is saying very loudly, Be quiet! You need to be quiet. You need to be quiet. You'll wake mum. You'll wake her. to be angry. And you hear the voice very quickly, Caitlin, of Miss Jenna. Oh, shut the fuck up. Oh, you two. You're done rooting around in the bloody sewage. We're trying to get this guy to confess, not do plumbing. Fucking shrink. Oh, I get the blame. You do. I look to, uh, yeah, I look to Caitlin and just to go after you. She will step out and uh, she will walk straight past uh, Jenna, paying her absolutely no mind whatsoever, no regard. uh, And she walks past Franklin and, again, doesn't pay him any mind, but she walks past confidently uh, and... There's a look of annoyance on her face that Jenna will probably assume is directed at her, but she specifically doesn't look at Franklin, but walks straight past his face and looks very annoyed or quietly angry as she does so and uh, strides into the master bedroom. You enter the master bedroom. The air here is cold and raw, and there's water dripping from the ceiling. Now you think you realise why you could hear two drips, but again, it was very unclear for a moment there. But no, there's water dripping, maybe from a leak in the ceiling. Again, you could hear the rain pattering outside quite heavily at this point. You also notice the bed in the room is immaculately well made. On the floor rug, all the fringes are perfectly laid out. The wardrobe door is closed. It's quite a big wardrobe in the room. It's like a walk-in wardrobe, from what I understand. 
Yes, you also notice quite a few kids' toys and cardboard boxes up here. Or at least the boxes that once contained them. It looks like they've been emptied recently. I just turn and look to my friend Joshua, and uh, I will gesture to the wardrobe. Uh, yeah, I walk over, and before going over, I look at Franklin. I sort of look at Caitlin first before doing this. Again, with that sort of, shall we play along? What's in the wardrobe, Franklin? He sort of looks stern for a moment. Fuck would I know? Don't fucking know! Jenna, at this point, intercedes a little, remarking, You fucking know, Mills. That's where you put the girl. Eh? Come on, stop wasting our goddamn time. At this, Caitlin and Joshua, Mr. Mill suddenly again looks down, starts very nervously wiping his arm. He remarks, Sister will be home soon. We really should all be gone. Why are we so sure? We gotta wait. Mum will be angry. She's late. And then again, his eyes just sort of focus on the wardrobe. And then he snaps out of that. Your silence. And then quickly sort of goes, Look, just. Just let, let, let. Take me outside and shoot me there. Just take me outside, shoot me there. I'll answer all your fucking questions outside. Let, this, this place is fucking, there's something in the air. Let, let, let's just go outside. You can fucking frame me out there. Come on, what, what are we doing in this fucking house? Caitlin is going to step over to Felicia. What's the smell on her breath? Whiskey. Definitely whiskey. Hmm. Does she have any glaze to her eyes right now? No. Okay. Still early days. Um, I'm going to look to her and I'm going to say Felicia, I understand you harbour a lot of anger towards this man. Oh, really? But at the rate you're going you might as well quit the subtle tactics and try and throw him in the wardrobe. You know what, Shrink? You give the order, I'll fucking do it. I'm not here to give anybody orders. Um, can I roll something to see if I can trigger her to do just that? It sounds like you want to influence I another. do indeed want to influence another. Roll plus your charisma. That... Is a lucky number 13. Caitlin, Jenna looks at you and smiles. Yeah. Yeah, tell you what, Shrink. You tell me to do it. I'll put him in the closet. I'd like to hear you tell me to do it. I could never condone such a barbaric act. Well, in that case... Why should I bother, eh? Mills is nodding very vigorously at this point, like, Yeah, let's fucking go! Like, don't fuck me the fucking closet! She's in there, she's in there. You don't want to put me in there with her. Don't put me in there with her. Caitlin, like, is very clearly making it seem like she does... She's she's putting the idea in Jenna's head, but she in no way has said, put her in the closet. She's saying, at the rate you're going, you might as well just throw him in the closet if that's sort of how aggressive you're going to be towards him. Indeed, but you sense almost amusement coming from Felicia and she's like, come on, Doc. Give in. You want to see him suffer as much as I do? Just say, I believe it would be very, whatever, some doctor thing and put him in the closet. I'll even be gentle, won't I, Frankie? Katz opens the closet door. Caitlin steps out, sort of like, specifically steps out uh, of the scene sort of taking her back so she's not blocking the doorway but she also making it look as if she's very wants no part of whatever is about to happen and she's not an officer you guys are yeah Katz opens the doorway and the way that this opens out I believe there is a window right uh, in the wall next to the wardrobe opens it and he smiles charmingly at uh, Felicia and makes a point of looking out the window. Um, what's in the wardrobe? 
As the wardrobe is opened, you see a small light bulb hanging from the ceiling inside. Currently off, of course. Lots of boxes, old clothes, new clothes, possibly belonging to the family. That's about it, really. And of course, a space in the middle has been cleared very recently and scrubbed in a CSI fashion. A body was, after all, here very recently. Felicia looks at cats. She looks at you. And she goes, Honestly, Doc, thought you had some guts. But apparently you're all, Oh no, I possibly couldn't. Well, fine. Come on, Frankie. Have a closer look. And she sort of hefts Frankie forwards. As Franklin moves forwards, he starts to really withdraw and just start struggling and keep saying, mm, I don't want to go in with the, No, I don't. Not with... She's in there. She's in there. I, the, the mum will be angry. Before this happens, I've got a good view of all this, right? Yes. Then, in which case, Caitlin almost withdraws from this, sort of holding... Her iPad defensively uh, against her chest as uh, she makes sure the camera lens follows. You notice something out of the corner of your eye, by the way, Mr. Katz, which is weird because you really should be focused on this scene of a man about to be forced into a cupboard. But the thing is, what you see on the bedside table really startles you. You also smell something in the air. Cigarette smoke. And... You notice a cigarette pack next to the bed. A cigarette pack of Virginia Slims. You've not seen a cigarette pack of Virginia Slims in this sort of box since you were a kid. It's open and some cigarettes are missing. And you can smell the smoke from where you're standing. Katz is horribly distracted. He just stares at the box. I'm assuming that, as I said, I basically opened up the door and all but you know, blocked myself from the scene and uh, looking out the window. So I'm assuming, you know, as the door is opened, that he is, you know, look, wanted to look out the window, but then saw the bedside table. It was also more the smell. Like, as you were looking out the window, you sort of sniffed. And that's what drew you over to look. I think sort of standing behind the door as he is not one to lose composure. Um, You know, in that, when you open a door, there's almost that weird little triangle space that is formed with a wall such as this. His hands start to shake just a bit before he clenches it into a fist and sort of brings it up to his, to his mouth and he's listening very intently um, to what is happening with Franklin as most all of his reactions have been what that have been of most of interest has been what he has been said. So as Felicia muscles him in and it's all but with his ear to the door, even though the door is open to listen to what is happening as Franklin goes in. But he's also trying to hold himself together. Hmm. Hmm. Caitlin, your attention is fully on what's happening in front of you. You maybe cast a glance over and notice Mr. Katz is looking a little... Looking at something, but you look straight back to the scene unfolding. Jenna pulls Mr. Mills straight up to the wardrobe and sort of shoves his head in. Well, Franklin? Well, well, well. What do we think, eh? How many did you kill in here? One... Maybe when you were a kid you killed fucking more, eh? Maybe there's fucking tons of dead bodies in here, eh? 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 She's speaking nonsense, clearly. Sounding a bit weird, actually, herself. Um, Mills is extremely agitated. He is struggling against all this. He's actually almost starting to sound like he's weeping. Caitlin steps forward quickly and says, That is enough. Felicia. Felicia turns to look at you and just flings Franklin back. Franklin scurries out of the room on all fours, sort of crawling along, repeating to himself, 
mother will be home soon, mother will be home soon. And the second he gets out of the room, he's caught by the penitentiary guard and immediately like, you fucking crazy bitch, you and your goddamn shrink. Get me the fuck out of here. Just get me the fuck out of here. And the penitentiary guard looks to Mr. Katz and just sort of taps his watch. Like, Yes, it's time we get moving along. I uh, basically motion for Caitlin. How does the penitentiarium guard uh, react to him sort of come crawling out? Does he pull him to his feet or anything? He didn't give a shit. He literally just pulled him up, got him back into a sort of secure position. Again, obviously, he's completely handcuffed. He's literally only paid attention to tap the watch. He's already gone back to pulling Frankie Mills down the stairs. He's clearly on a schedule, this man. He doesn't care what's going on. Can I try to read Caitlin and her motivations over the last... as this scene set itself up and unfolded? Certainly, you will roll read person and depending on your results Josh will answer truthfully but only of course in a body language intuition kind of way that is a 12 one question for him is she sorry she has a moment of sort of like there's that disapproving sort of shake of her head but she will pull her iPad back and sort of seem to look at something on it and nod as if she's seen enough. Thinking back on Katz and her deliberateness with her iPad from packing it up, rolling the cord, everything like that being somewhat technology savvy himself can I I don't know whether it be a observed situation or something else to put two and two together that she might have filmed this I will I will point out the torch is still on and she's using her iPad torch to uh, to cover and you will also know that she has all of her notes uh, from the sort of his criminal record, his history, everything like that, because that's what she did the presentation by. That's what she's been referring to. So, um, no, it's more the fact that you looked down after that happened. Uh, that's actually the more the tell that I, that that's more the tell is you reviewing that necessarily than anything else and whether he can read that mm. tell. I'd say this is observing a situation. So I'd say roll plus perception to see. Ooh, that's only a six plus one. That's only a seven. You sort of give Caitlin a very hard stare and your eye immediately goes to the phone and her equipment and straight back to her. Caitlin, you are very aware that Mr. Katz is staring intently at your equipment. And you, how do you respond to that? Caitlin looks to you and she will take a step over and she turns the screen uh, to show the criminal record of Franklin a lot of things here seem to reflect on his past would you not agree the past is something that is ever present within a decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis. Something as simple as wallpaper, as sounds, sights, smells. They can bring back memories. Of course. Always, when you're studying something, it's always nice to have all the data that you can get. Make sure that you can review it later. And he sort of taps on the iPad you know, these records are so helpful to have. To The second you touch her iPad, she pulls it against her chest and you notice there's a flicker in the corner of her lips. Like, the second you lay a finger on that iPad, her perfectly calm composure cracks almost imperceptibly and you see 
genuine annoyance flicker for just a second, but then she's got it back under control. He gives her, reading that, just flashes that big fake smile that he uses all the time, lifts an eyebrow, and motions ever so graciously for her to go ahead and uh, head down. She turns and she goes to walk out of the room, but before she does, she stops, sighs, looks around the room, and she is going to say, It is such a shame what damage it can do to another human being. When they lose their mother to such tragic circumstance. And she walks out. And yes, Mr. Katz, you are definitely certain she was up to something. But unfortunately, of course, your role. Let her know that you know. What do you do, Mr. Katz? So uh, I watch her as uh, she heading down the stairs. I sort of look after her as she goes that way. Katz looks back into the room. Are the Virginia Slims still on the side table? No. He takes note that they're not. And then uh, heads down the stairs. And you all begin to exit the building. Any further investigation, unfortunately, seems to have been hampered by a penitentiary guard indicating you only have about an hour left. It's going to take ten minutes to get to the final area, and you're going to have a very little amount of time to look around and finish this up. Not to mention the weather has worsened considerably. As you all begin to drive and make your way to Zug Island, a storm has truly begun. The rain is pelting against your car. Fog, chill, and rain. The stench of smoke and rust, rippling water and oily puddles. Zug Island is a man-made island with factories and steelworks. Heaps of coal are delivered there by ship. It looks like another world driving into this ashen landscape. Everything is reefed in a white-grey haze coming from the storm and the rain. Still, though, fires from the smelting plant create strange halos in the mist. The wrecked ship rests on the dock. The entire ship, the scene where this final part of the mystery unfolded, is rusty and mouldering, and the ship is in very bad repair. However, luckily for you, it's quite easy to get on board the part of the ship you need to be on and make your way to the engine room. Detective Jenner knows the way. She's been here before and assures you it's actually quite a quick trip. You're not, after all, going around with the entire boat. You're simply finding your way down to the engine room where, well, Franklin Mills was found. The body of that poor woman, utterly ravaged. You are all pulling up to the boat. The wind and rain are falling heavily. I sit in the back of Joshua's car and wait for him to collect me. No, I come around with the uh, umbrella and uh, escort her up the gangplank as they are often slick. You make sure that she is safe going up there. Uh, we follow Miss Jenner down uh, to the engine room. I'm taking note of the smell. Is it the same smell from the bathroom? Yes. Yes, it is. You quickly made your way to the engine room. A few things happened on the way. Aiden volunteered to keep an eye out, sort of being the guard to the top of the stairways, if you will. Again, you literally walk straight up onto the boat by some ladders. Aiden specifically doesn't come down to the engine room. No, he volunteered to stay at the top where uh, you began your descent into the bowels of the ship. You came up on railings, and actually, Miss Jenna seems to be correct. It was very easy to find the engine room. You literally walked down a few stairs, old signs pointed to the engine room, and it seems quite central. The stairwells are dark and cold, made of steel, paint peeling from the walls, and everything is dripping with moisture. The sound of the storm outside is very audible inside this old ship. Amid the clamour and noise, your flashlights cast shadows about the ship. You're currently standing just about to enter the entry room when Mr. Katz takes that smell. That smell that, yes, it's identical to the bathroom. 
You have listened to a special episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we play the adventure Oakwood Heights for Cult Divinity Lost, together with our friends Josh and Tallsquall, who are part of the amazing team over at Encounter Roleplay. Find them on twitch.tv, Encounter Roleplay, YouTube, and their two excellent podcasts, Turncloaks, as well as Tomes and Tentacles. Cult Divinity Lost is made by Helmgast. Oakwood Heights was designed by the acclaimed master of horror, Peter Nalo. The music was created by Atrium Carceri and is used with permission from their label, Cryo Chamber. Head over to cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for more delicious dark ambient. As always, a big thank you to all supporters. If you enjoy the show and want to encourage our work, head over to Patreon and see if you want to support the show there. We hope you enjoyed this special episode and look forward to meeting again. Thank you for listening.